Hello, my name's Andy Gibbs. I was born in Hitchin and have lived most of my life here. The town has a long and remarkable history, so it's no surprise that many excellent histories have been written about the town by local amateur historians. This is no attempt to compete with those fine works. Instead, it is a personal view. I'll try and place Hitchin in its historical and national context. It is certainly an affectionate view and at times light-hearted and with no apology we will try and show the town off at its best. We hope that whether you're a local or a welcome visitor to the town that you will enjoy this video and perhaps it will inspire you to find out more about the town that I love. The 2016 referendum on Britain's membership of the European Union has created much debate about the nature of Britishness. What is Britain and where can it be found? The answers to these questions lie in complexity, not simplicity. They are subjective and individual answers will be given by every person you ask. But what if I was to show you a small town that historically has been through everything that Britain has been through and today represents much of what is positive about British society. Welcome to Hitchin. Britain in a nutshell. An ancient market town that grew rich on the profits of agriculture. Was devastated by the Black Death. Ravaged by the Reformation. It played its part in the English Civil War. It is the home of the educational revolution. Hitchin was modernised by the coming of the railway. It has a rich mix of architectural styles. Affected by two world wars, it has been enriched by many cultural influences. Both ancient and modern, Hitchin reflects all the tragedies, challenges and successes whose cumulative effect makes up what is Britain today. Let's have a look in a little more detail.
Hitchin in the county of Hertfordshire is an ancient settlement. It lies close to the prehistoric pathway, the Icknield Way, and there are Roman remains nearby. In 792 AD, King Offa of Mercia established a Benedictine monastery here. It takes its name from the Hicca people, a British tribe who we know of from the 7th century document, the Tribal Hydage. So it seems that Hitchin folk were indigenous Britons. How much more British could Hitchin be? Hitchin is a classic English market town. Let us return to the old market square to explore further. There has been a market in Hitchin since at least the 12th century. Hitchin's market has no charter, which suggests that it predated the time when monarchs used these to regulate towns and draw in revenue. It was certainly a prosperous market and many local merchants grew rich on the proceeds of the wool trade. They gave thanks for their good fortune by building St Mary's Church, the largest parish church in Hertfordshire. During the Reformation and later in the English Civil Wars, this church was to suffer the iconoclastic battering of the forces of Protestantism and Puritanism. The recesses in the porch would have held statues of the saints and the windows would have been full of the glorious coloured light of stained glass. In 1752, the Reverend William Cole described St Mary's Church Tower as one of the most clumsy and heavy that I have ever seen. However, this Hertfordshire stump is typical of the county and commands fine views of the town's historic heart and the green and pleasant land which lies beyond. Before the Reformation, these walls would have been adorned with beautiful, colourful depictions of the scriptures. St Mary's may have lost its medieval wall paintings, but it cannot be denied, it retains a superb interior. riverside location has become emblematic of the town. But the piety of Hitchin's residents would not spare them from the horrors of the plague. This is Queen Street, but until the 1860s it was known as Dead Street. In 1349 the Black Death cast its shadow over Hitchin, leaving a legacy which was to last for 500 years. A centuries-old reminder that every man, woman and child had been wiped out by that terrifying 14th century disaster. The Dead Street area was filled with a warren of horrible slums and dingy alleyways where the poor of the town eked out an existence cut off from the rest of otherwise prosperous Hitchin. The houses had no sanitation the workers received but pitiful remuneration and the children had no access to education. Joseph Lancaster is my name and I have been charged by our Lord above and His Gracious Majesty King George III of that name to bring learning to all the children of this glorious kingdom. 
And so I have traveled far and wide throughout this land and by mine own hand founded six and ninety schools. And in the year 1808 came I to the godly town of Hitchin, where its wise and prosperous worthies established a school here in accordance with my instructions. And I see now that since my visit, a wonderful monitorial schoolroom has been built here in the area once known as Dead Street. For is it not so that the true wealth of nations lies in its prepared people? So education from an early age is essential. Lancaster was a true visionary, a man well ahead of his time. He attempted to offer free universal education to all children nearly a hundred years before the state did so. At this time, educating the poor was considered to be very dangerous, potentially sparking a revolution in this country. However, his work would lead directly to education becoming available to millions of children who had previously been denied it. Lancaster, as well as the 96 schools that he personally founded in this country, his methods spread to Europe, to Russia, to South America and North America, and the British and Foreign School Society, who took over his work, set up schools in every continent on the planet. In this one schoolroom, 300 children were taught by one master using just two books. So efficient and effective were Lancaster's methods that dozens of similar schoolrooms were built all across the country and indeed across the world. In 1845, this school was very badly damaged in the great fire of Dead Street, which ravaged this area. But happily, this monitorial schoolroom survived and is the last remaining such schoolroom anywhere in the world. As such, this museum, the British Schools Museum in Hitchin, can rightly claim to be the home of the educational revolution. Lancaster's visit to Hitchin in 1808 led William Wilshire and his colleagues to open a school here in 1810. It stayed open until 1969. In the 1990s, it reopened again to the public, this time as the British Schools Museum. The school helped some children to escape the horrors of Dead Street, but it was not until the 1850s that the living conditions were improved. In 1849, exactly 500 years after the plague had scoured the area, a public health report, the Ranger Report, scandalised the town. The conditions described in the report sound more medieval than Victorian. The authorities acted. Housing and sanitation was improved and the name changed to Queen Street in honour of Queen Victoria's Silver Jubilee in 1862. The arrival of the railway in Hitchin in 1850 brought many new jobs and increased prosperity. The gentry and their fine townhouses in the centre, however, did not wish to be disturbed by this new railway line and insisted the station be built a mile to the east of the town. The area between the station and the town quickly filled with new houses, many accommodating railwaymen, their families, and people working in associated trades. A church was built and a school, and it seems that Victorian town planners understood where new houses are built, new infrastructure is required. At the time of the Ranger Report in 1849, the town's population was around 8,000, and overcrowding was becoming a serious problem. The Dead Street slums were not finally cleared until the late 1920s, by which time the town's population had grown to 12,000.
Much of this expansion was due to the coming of the railway. The Great Northern Railway arrived in Hitchin in 1850 and was a catalyst to trade, prosperity and house building. My grandfather was a steam engine driver from Barnsley in South Yorkshire. He moved his family to the busy Hitchin Junction in 1933. My mother remembers that the street in which they lived, almost every house was that of a railway man and his family. This is Hitchin Priory. In 1317, a Carmelite monastic house was established here under a charter granted by King Edward II. In 1539, following Henry VIII's split from the Church of Rome, the house was dissolved, stripped of much of its riches, and became a possession of the crown. In 1553, it was sold to Ralph Radcliffe, and it stayed in the Radcliffe family until the 1960s. During the civil wars of the 1640s, Hitchin came out in favour of the parliamentary side and became a regional headquarters for the Cromwellian forces. There's a local tale that the war had placed a dangerous obstacle between a royalist cavalryman and his one true love, a maid working at Hitchin Priory. Unable to quench his ardour, one evening he paid her a secret visit, only to be captured and killed by parliamentarian troopers. It is said that on a still night, the sound of his horse's hooves, as he fled in desperate but vain escape, can still be heard here in Tyler Street. This is Butts Close, an ancient area of common land, just a stone's throw from the town centre. The name Butts comes from the archery targets, or butts, that were used here, set up on the close, for men to practise with their bows and arrows, through until the Tudor period. It's believed that Henry VIII, on one of his several visits to Hitchin, practised his archery skills right here. It's been used for fairs and circuses for decades, and in 1904 saw the extraordinary spectacle of Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show here in the heart of Hitchin. Just across the road from Butts Close is Top Field, home of Hitchin Town Football Club. The Canaries were formed in 1865, and one of only three clubs who competed for the original FA Cup and still do so to this day. If only we could persuade Hitchin-born Jack Wilshire to sign for us. We've returned to St Mary's Church and in particular to the war memorial that was erected here in the year 1921. It carries the names of 365 men of Hitchin who lost their lives in the Great War. A huge number for such a small town and replicated tragically across this country. Included amongst the Roll of Honour is Frank Young, who was awarded the Victoria Cross posthumously. Second Lieutenant Frank Edward Young, late of the 1st Battalion, Hertfordshire Regiment, for most conspicuous bravery, determination, and exceptional devotion to duty on the 18th of September, 1918. He was last seen fighting hand to hand against a considerable number of the enemy. A gentle stroll around Hitchin's town centre can be most rewarding. Look up above the shop fronts and you will see a diverse and fascinating architectural landscape, the medieval. Georgian, Victorian, even the utilitarian style of the 1970s. I should also mention some of Hitchin's more notable residents. 
Lord Lister, who saved millions of lives with his pioneering of antiseptic surgery, went to school here. Behind this wonderful medieval building on Bancroft were the laboratory, distillery and workshops of William Ransom. Ransom was a schoolmate of Joseph Lister and qualified as a botanist and pharmacist. In 1910, he was elected president of the pharmaceutical company. Ransom distilled lavender for local firm Perks and Llewellyn, which had been founded back in 1760. Lavender has been grown in Hitchin since the 1500s, and its quality was such that Queen Victoria herself visited the town in 1851 to be presented with a bottle of lavender oil by Ransom. The Perks and Llewellyn pharmacy shop has been preserved. Part can be seen here at Hitchin Lavender, and the remainder at North Hertfordshire Museum. In 1846, William Ransom established the oldest independent pharmaceutical company in the United Kingdom. The firm was a huge success and he was soon able to buy this wonderful house, Little Benslow Hills, now home to the Benslow Music Trust. Ransom was a man of seemingly inexhaustible energy, running a successful business, serving in many civic capacities and indulging his increasing obsession with archaeology. Just around the corner from William Ransom's former house is Benslow House. Now a residential care home, this building further demonstrates the very important place that Hitchin has had in the history and development of education. In 1869, Girton College was founded here. Girton was the first residential college in this country to offer an education for women at degree level. Although part of Cambridge University, it was founded here in Hitchin, away from the main body of Cambridge University. This was because higher education for women at this time was a highly controversial subject. In 1944, the funeral of Sir Henry Wood, father of the proms, was held here at St Mary's in Hitchin. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And global superstar James Bay is a Hitchin lad, Hitchin born and bred. It was in this fine house in Tilehouse Street that the polymath George Chapman first translated into English those epic works of Homer, the Odyssey and the Iliad. Achilles' baneful wrath resound, O goddess, that imposed infinite sorrow upon the Greeks, and many brave souls loosed from breasts heroic, and sent them far to that invisible cave where no light comforts, and their limbs to dogs and vultures gave. In this fine house in the tiny village of Charlton, less than a mile from the centre of Hitchin, in 1813, was born Sir Henry Bessemer, engineer, inventor, father of the steel industry. In this brief look at Hitchin, we've seen how it mirrors almost every aspect of British history. It's been affected by plague, by fire, by war and by urbanisation, yet it retains much that is charming and rural. Hitchin is a small town, some say a sleepy little town, but it has played a major part in the history of education, of industry and of medicine. It's a thriving town with many independent shops and businesses, a thriving local music scene, theatres, sports clubs, and a truly unique museum. This is Hitchin, Britain in a nutshell. <laughs>